If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Hello and welcome to this new formatted Politically Speaking podcast. I'm your host, as always, Chris McDaniel, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in a different studio today... Uh, Joe Manis with the St. Louis Beacon. And... Jason Rosenbaum with the St. Louis Beacon. And our special guest today... Uh, State Senator Eric Schmidt. Yes. So we have a new (laughs) format here for the summer when the legislature isn't in session. There could be fewer political events happening. So we're going to have on some guests. Yeah, we wanted to dig deeper into the various topics. Yes. So we're going to chat about a few things. We're going to have a freewheeling, fun conversation (laughs) about tax policy and tax credits. So much fun. Make it sound so enticing. Only the Beacon and KWMU. (laughs) Hopefully, no one's turned it off (laughs) so far. We lost all of our listeners just now. But you know, let's just you know before we get into the topics, just you know. Introduce yourself. Say why you got into politics. You know how you're the tallest senator in Missouri history. <laughs> stuff like that. Well, I uh, I grew up in St. Louis, and I grew up in North County, actually uh, near the airport. My parents uh, uh, raised me and my two younger sisters. And my dad actually uh, was a meat cutter and went to night school um, while we were young kids, and then got a job at AB um, and worked there for 30 years. I went to uh, uh, Desmet. And then after that, I went to uh, I went to Truman State. And when I was there, um, I uh, I was involved in a lot of things. I played a couple sports there. I founded a Habitat for Humanity. Um, and I think my experience at Desmet and and working with Habitat for Humanity, I kind of had this interest in just being involved in the community. Uh-huh. And I think that's what led me ultimately. I um, became chair of the Young Lawyers Section um, of the Missouri Bar, and that was kind of the public service arm of the Missouri Bar. And then in Glendale, got involved in Glendale, and that's not really political in Glendale. There's not a lot of controversy in Glendale, uh, but became an alderman there. And then, you know, with term limits, um, an opportunity came up. I was meeting with uh, Mike Gibbons about his potential race in 2008, and he made a suggestion, um, talked to my wife about it. It wasn't anything I was planning on doing and just thought it was the best way for me to kind of continue that and, uh, and serve. And so I ran. Um, not sure. I really knew what I was getting myself into in a campaigning. You're raising money. Your name. It was yeah, a wacky race. I was, was actually Trump. looking at it last last yesterday. It, it was it's supposed to be you versus Kevin Gunn. Right. But Kevin Gunn got appointed to the PSC. The Democrats were furious at that, and it was a primary between um, Steve Eagleton and and James Trout. While you just you know had no primary, was able to you know, consolidate Republican support. It was supposed to be a competitive race, but you won, I think, what, 54, 45 or something yeah, like one, that? Yeah, one by 10 points. And in that district that year, uh, Barack Obama won by eight. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, uh, that, that that was the big year for the Democrats. Yeah, they, uh, in fact, I think I was the only Republican in that Senate district to win. Uh, that includes all the statewide office holders and then on the national level. Because that the district that I represent, um, it's changed a little bit. It's shifted further west, but it was kind of Shrewsbury and Webster to the east yes. really bordered the city and then went all the way out to, say, Baldwin. So it was mm-hmm. kind of this um, uh, middle area between the city and West County. Um, and uh, and I'm proud of that. I was able to, um, you know, kind of build a, a broader coalition, and I enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. And so be, it was gratifying on election night to be able to, uh, um, to win by 10 points in a really tough district. It was a lot of fun. And, and since then, um, serving in the Senate, um, I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the younger members, I guess, uh, to have been elected, but uh, the opportunity to serve as uh, chairman of the Economic Development Committee, um, to be in, on Senate leadership, and uh, really advocate for the region has been something that I've really tried to focus on. I think, you know, when you've got 45 percent of the state's GDP coming from the St. Louis region, I think it's really important for Republicans and Democrats to work together and move an agenda forward. And so that's what I've tried to work on. What Are, are there any particular issues that you've worked on since you've been in that you're particularly proud of? Well, I think um, um, the first thing I got probably um, the meatiest issue involved um, involved in right away was uh, on the autism insurance bill. Yes. Um, my uh, my son, uh, who's eight, he'll be nine uh, in August. Uh, before I ran, he was diagnosed with a rare genetic um, condition, and he has epilepsy, and he's on the autism spectrum. And he's nonverbal. So that was that's our life experience. That's when I go home on Thursday night. Um, that's, you know, we, um, um, I understand, um, uh, 
very well what families go through in trying to make sure that their that their child has the best chance to succeed and reach their full, full potential, whatever it is. So I worked on that. We were able to get that done. Uh, Senator Roop and I uh, worked on that. We were able to get um, um, some parity with other neurobiological conditions so that kids with autism who are diagnosed can get the services that they need. So that was really kind of the, the first issue. And then since then, probably the major focus has been on the economic development legislation. And so whether it was, um, you know, the airport is really important to me. I yeah. think as a region, um, you can't, if you can't connect to the rest of the world, if you want to, you know, be a, a place where you have uh, opportunities for trade, uh, an airport is just absolutely critical. It's what made St. Louis great in the first place. I mean, we were a trade center with, at the time, that predominant mode of, uh, of transportation, the steamboat. The East Bridge was built about 20 years too late. Yes, goes you, to you Chicago, and I have talked about that. And the rest is history. And I think, you know, moving forward, when you have 40% of um, – Um, all trade right now, not volume, but value of trade, flying, you have to have an airport to be able to connect to the rest of the world. And so that's why this idea of having uh, more cargo activity at the airport, I think, is really important. It helps lower landing fees and makes passenger routes uh, more viable because if you look at the debt structure of the airport right now, the landing fees are about four times as high as an airport like Atlanta, uh, twice as high as that um, of Chicago. And so airports derive their revenue by landed weight. And so if you can get those heavy cargo planes to land, I think that's a really important thing for us to focus on as a region. But this year, uh, of course, we focused uh, primarily on there were some there were incentives um, with the amateur sports legislation. Right. Right. Yes, but okay. uh, but also on the broad based tax relief measure, which uh, I've been working on for the last couple of years, and we were able to see something happen this year. Now, as, as you know, obviously the governor vetoed it last week. Uh, what do you think is the outlook, possibly as far as any veto override? And then I will, I do want to work in Schweik's uh, the state auditor's Hancock uh, report that just came out yesterday, which talked about how Missouri is spending is. Um, or, and income, the state income, is way below the Hancock limit. Yeah, I think, um, look, if you look at uh, what we were able to do, um, you're able to um, to reduce the tax liability for every single Missourian. That means, um, look, I didn't grow up, um, I grew up in a very middle class family. Um, for people to be able to take home more of what they earn is just something that's really, really important to me. So for that single mom that's working two jobs, for her to be able to keep more of her own paycheck is just philosophically something that I really believe in. And I think also if you look historically, um, whether it was John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, anytime you've had a broad-based tax relief measure and lowered rates across the board, you've seen expansion in the economy. And that's something that we wanted to work on um, as far as the individual rate by reducing that by half percent. But also um, when it comes to uh, most small businesses are organized in a way like LLCs or LLPs. And so for us to be able to reduce the tax liability in half for every single business in the state over a five- or a ten-year period, I think is a, is a really good thing for us to pursue. Missouri's ranked 48th um, in GDP growth over the last 10 years. We've lost half of our congressional delegation in the last 70 years. Yes. You know, I think that we, we deserve an opportunity to move forward in a different path. And I think this bill allows us that opportunity to do it, to have that, that broad-based tax relief. Um, the governor did veto it. Um, I think there's a, a, a um, we've got the votes in the Senate to override that veto, and the House is going to be really, really close. In fact, it may be exactly 109. Um, that's the number uh, with Jason Smith now going to Washington. Mm-hmm. I think that's the number that they're left with in the House. And so um, the House has to get every single Republican uh, to, to vote for that override. And overrides are rare, but I do think um, as a, uh, from a, a philosophical point of view, this is one thing that really unites uh, us in Jefferson City. This is something that I think we all viewed as a major accomplishment. It's Look, it's the first time we've had any significant tax reform in 100 years. So this opportunity doesn't come along every day. And so I think in September, there'll be a lot of drama, but hopefully we can get that done. Do you think that the, you know, the prescription drug aspect right. Right. is, is going to make it harder for those three Republicans in the House to I vote to override? I don't think so. That provision um, doesn't kick in until 2015. And I and I got to believe that if we go in next year in 2014, that will be one of the first bills that are prefiled. And I and I can't imagine there be any problem making that change. So I think that's something that has been uh, has been thrown out there. I think you know I think the governor. Um, I think he was probably going to veto it all along. Um, that's something that he's pointed to now. But I think that's something that we can address pretty easily in 2014 because it doesn't go into effect until 2015. But the reality is you never know um, when these moments exist in, in the history of your state to make a significant change. It's the, when, when you say wait till next year, sometimes it never happens. And so I hope that we uh, seize the opportunity uh, to make sure people can take home more of what they earn. So let's say you don't override the veto. 
I'm assuming that this is something that would come back in the legislative session of next year. Is there anything that would be changed in that bill? Um, well, I think we would address that provision. That, that uh, prescription drug provision, yeah, I think we, we would. which was the el- eliminating the exemption the for, bracket the, bracket that, for, that for the sales the tax. Yeah. This is for our listeners. And, so and, they and there's a second about. provision below it that seems to negate the previous. So there's, it, it admittedly is from ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we would try to address that and clarify that. But um, look, for me, um, I, uh, I'd like to go further. I'd like to go further with the kind of tax relief that we're talking about. I do think it'll grow our economy. I just think when you empower individuals to make those decisions, uh, they make better decisions than government. Tax policy isn't the only thing that matters, and there are essential services that need to be funded. But I do think when you look at the trajectory and the path that we've been on, the status quo just hasn't really been working. So a lot of the things that people are complaining about, uh, whether it's higher ed funding or whatever it is, we're, we're at where we're at with the pe- tax policy we've had for the last 100 years. So I think if we can make a significant change, uh, my hope would be we'd be able to grow. The other thing is uh, that's important to point out, on the eastern side of the state where we all live and where I represent, it's a very different dynamic with the state of Illinois. You know, the rivers really do divide us in many Mm -hmm. ways. There's geographical boundaries. The population shifts have traditionally been to the west. They've been in the state of Missouri. On the western side of the state, um, State Line Road is what only divides Missouri and Kansas. It's like moving your business across Manchester Road. I mean, it's not a significant move. Um, And so what you're seeing in Kansas with what Kansas has done with their tax policy, they eliminated those business taxes, and they lowered the uh, the personal tax rate at the same time. Look, if you can save 6 to 7%, And I'm not saying this is going to happen all at once because a lot of those larger businesses are locked into long-term leases. But over time, when those leases are going to be renewed, if you can save 6 to 7% on your income tax rate, uh, that's a lot of money, especially if you're a small business owner that, um, let's say you bring down $70,000 for your family because you own a dry cleaning operation. I mean, if you move across that road, I mean, people are rational economic actors and make smart decisions. I think over time there will be an impact. And what what I said on the Senate floor on this issue was, there is a fiscal note associated with us doing nothing here. If we do nothing, there is going to be a loss of revenue. And that's something that a lot of people really haven't talked about. But I do think this provides us an opportunity for growth. Now, the, the other thing that you were involved in near the end was tax credit mm-hmm. debate. And there's yeah. been this since uh, there was action in 2009, I guess was your first year in the right. Senate, where they did cap historics at 140 with mm-hmm. the exception, I guess, for a million uh, and uh, below. Uh, 140 million just for right. our, our, our listeners. But, but since then, there have been efforts to kind of change that in the low income uh, housing tax credit. And it's always kind of floundered and failed. And this year was no exception. Kind of a two part question. Why do you think there hasn't been consensus on that issue? And what do you think is going to need to be done to for the Senate and the House to to finally come to some sort of agreement on that? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a challenging issue in the sense that and we went into a special session on this issue in two years ago in 2011. To try to find that balance between, um, look, I think that with the incentive programs that we have in place, we ought to constantly be uh, reviewing them. Uh, So I don't even have a problem with sunsets, having sunsets on the programs um, so that you have a constant review. If they work, you renew them. If they don't, you let them sunset. Um, So what we tried to do this year was we tried to have some sort of uh, um, delineation between what these uh, incentives and these credits do. We moved out of my committee and out of the Senate floor and over to the House pretty early. Um, the benevolent tax credits, the ones like for pregnancy resource centers or food pantries, things that are more charitable in nature, those exist in our in our code. Um, we moved those out early and were able to separate those from the larger tax credit debate. One of the other things we were able to do early on, which I'm proud of, is we were able to say, look, on this amateur sports incentive, the landscape has changed across the country. States like Ohio and Texas and Florida are landing these very lucrative events that we used to be able mm-hmm. to host here, Final Fours, Frozen Fours, Wrestling Championships. And that landscape has just changed. So we devised a per-ticket incentive that basically you're assuming that somebody spends a little over $100 for one of these events, which is very conservative. If they get a hotel room and 90% of the people that go to these things are from outside of our state. So um, we were able to get that done early. And I think that has borne fruit pretty early. I think it's going to be announced, if it hasn't already, that uh, that St. Louis has landed the SEC basketball tournament um, for 2017. They were able to take that piece of legislation down to Nashville to the SEC officials and get that event. And so I think that's a positive, and that can bring in revenue and also money for those businesses that support those events, restaurants, bars, uh, retailers, hotels, the hospitality industry. Those are important sectors of our economy. We were able to move those out early. Then the idea was to put together a more scaled-down package of economic development and tax credit reform. We had 
had the freight forwarder piece in there that's critical for Lambert. We had um, the data center legislation. You had the angel investor credit in there. Uh, and then also we took a look at, from a broad perspective, what are we doing right now in our state's portfolio? Admittedly, we're, we're pretty real estate heavy. Mm-hmm. I support the historic preservation tax credit. It's done a lot. We're in, we're in Midtown right now. Uh, we're in, you know, in the Grand Center, and I know there's been a lot of utilization here, and there's been a, just this place looks – when I was in law school here 15 years ago, this place looks totally different. It's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, in downtown, Washington Avenue, it's done a lot because development in the urban core is just different than in greenfields, and you kind of have to acknowledge that. Um, but we're trying to say what is the right level? You know, $100 million a year is a lot of money still, and that's kind of where the debate was, bringing those caps down that would provide opportunity for other – uh, incentives to move forward, other ideas that people have had, because that's, the, that's, the, that's been the rub. Some people want to get rid of them all. Some people want to have certain caps. And so we tried to strike that balance. And the low-income housing credit, again, um, when, you know, in the 1960s, when you were, the government was building high-rises, that experiment just didn't work. So the idea was, with Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan to some degree, to shift that to incent the private sector to build those. But the question is, how much do you need? How much right. are you going to spend every year? And I think that's a very reasonable discussion. I've tried to stay away from the rhetoric and the, the demagoguery. You haven't of called anybody corrupt or anything, right. <laughs> like some of your colleagues. Yeah, and I think it's important. Look, you've got to work with people. And, um, and it's not, it's not um, fair to think that everybody's going to view the world exactly the same way. My wife and I don't agree on everything. So you have to leave room, I think, for people to be able to uh, work together and find compromise. That's not a dirty word. I mean, that's how our our system of government was set up. People have different ideas. The House and the Senate operate differently. We have a Democrat governor. So anyway, that's kind of where we've been. We haven't been able to get that total agreement on what that package looks like. And uh, hopefully moving forward, uh, we can find that. Because I do think some of the things that are out there that are in our portfolio are in desperate need of some reform. And I also think there's some other ideas out there that, that should move forward. Now, talking about Kansas, though, I mean, this is in connection with not just the tax credit, but also going back to the tax cut thing. Um, they've had to make dramatic cuts, at least in the short term, in their education spending and some other stuff because their income has plummeted with them eliminating uh, so much of their income tax. Now, uh, do you think that... Um, a, some of the critics say this is something Missouri shouldn't emulate because of that. But B, do you think, well, you need to see what happens in Kansas in two or three years? Or, I mean, do you, it, how do, well, I mean, what's your message when people say, well, why should we um, keep that, override the tax cut veto and uh, maybe leave tax credits where they are or whatever? When we're seeing what's happening in Kansas, when they're having to make all these cuts in the programs, because at least in the short term, the other income isn't coming in and they've cut their income tax so much. Well, a few points. First is, I think um, if you uh, we heard some testimony in the session um, that uh, the business licenses to the Kansas secretary of state. I think the number was doubled in the last year. Okay. So you've got you you have a lot of and I think, look, this is going to be a steady flow. Um uh, and whether it's a gush and whether it's a it's a waterfall, I don't know what happens on State Line Road. But again, uh, people are going to be making decisions that are in their best interest. And tax policy, like I said, admittedly, is not the only thing that matters. It's not, but it's a very important factor. The other thing that's important to point out, I think, historically, again, um, economy our economy has expanded when we've done this. Um, I, I firmly believe that. I think it's a, it's a core belief of mine, I think, not just philosophically, but if you look at the evidence of when this has happened, I think we would grow. I think you would actually see um, higher revenues when people are spending more. Look, when that small business has more money in their pocket, they're going to spend the money on inventory and hiring people and making those decisions that are good for their business. That ultimately expands and gives people more purchasing power. The other thing that's important to point out in that bill is there's a number of triggers. It's a very responsible way, in my view, of dealing with this kind of broad-based tax reform over a five- or ten-year period. It's phased in. Right. Um, it's not like Kansas did it all in one year. It's phased in over a five- or ten-year period. And also there are certain triggers um, that revenue has to increase by $100 million before you get to the next phase. And so really what you would see and what not a lot of people have talked about is over a ten-year period, you'd have to see – um, over a billion dollars of growth in revenues to see eight hundred million dollars go back to people and businesses, and so it really is a I think a, a smart way to go about moving forward. It recognizes that we want to be reasonable in the way we approach it, but also that uh, we just believe that that people when they're empowered and they keep more of what they earn is the right path. Now the Hancock now 
Stay Under White came out within the last 24 hours with this, um, I wouldn't call it an audit, but a report on the Hancock Amendment, which for our listeners is the, um, it's a amendment in the Constitution that restricts how much the state can take in mm-hmm. without requiring refunds. Uh, and the last refunds were in 1999. Well, Schweik's report showed that, A, the um, income that the state took in in FY 2012, which was a year ago, actually, was almost $4 billion below the the uh, Hancock limit, which meant, in effect, that the state general revenue could actually bring in about 40% more before it would kick in the Hancock Amendment, He all which would require the refunds. It also showed, he had a bunch of charts, that um, in... In FY 2012, what the state took in was actually, it was like $800 million less than what the state took in in FY 2008, which was kind of the peak year before Mm -hmm. the bottom dropped out in the economy. So I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying that, okay, that's out there. So you've got some critics. They haven't said anything yet, but I'm guessing that they might say, well, here we've got a Republican state auditor that, and and he wasn't taking positions on any of this, but showing that um, the state could bring in a lot more money before it's even where it was in 2008, so why are we talking about tax cuts now? My point being is the critics might roll that out during this fight to try to persuade some Republicans, especially in the House, not to override the veto. So Will that affect anything, or will it not? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, in, in there, I guess, suppose the premise is that we ought to wait until government continues to grow to make decisions. Okay. You know, and so I would I would probably fundamentally object to that. I think now is the right time to move forward. And again, you've got the triggers in there that I think is a responsible uh, path forward. Um, I, you know, at the end of the day. Um, uh, whether we're at the Hancock limit or not, I think now is the right time. We're we're kind of at a critical time. I think you're seeing a lot of states around us in the Midwest, um, in the Midwest, making these decisions. Oklahoma, um, uh, uh, Iowa. Um, there are a lot of go- Kansas. I mean, there's just a lot of governors that are kind of being bold uh, when it comes to tax policy. And I think states were meant to be the laboratories uh, for democracy. I think we've devised um, something, I think, that's that's responsible and can grow our economy. I mean, I really believe that. I think at the end of the day, when people have uh, more of what they earn, that is the right path. And and that is not to say, again, that government does, doesn't does have very um, legitimate purposes. I think taking care of people who can't take care of themselves right. as Republicans is something that I believe in. You know, all those sorts of things um, to make sure that the government is doing what it should do to provide those basic services for people, uh, infrastructure, Structure, bridges, roads, all that stuff, but at the same time, um, acknowledging that um, this is a way to slow the growth of government in one way, but also to allow people to keep more of their paycheck. And I think the people that I talk to, um, you know, in my district and in other places, that's something that they talk a lot about. A lot of the small business owners will say, look, the uncertainty out there, or if I just had a little bit more capital, I could invest in this new equipment purchase, or I could hire somebody to help here, but I'm just a little concerned. There's a lot of things with the federal tax rate increasing at the federal level. Um, I think it's it's incumbent upon the states to make these kinds of decisions now, and I hope Missouri is able to override the veto. Okay. Well, we've transitioned a little bit into into the news section of our show already a little bit, talking about the Hancock Amendment. <clears throat> Joe, do you and the Republican senator will be joining us and chiming in uh, as he has. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the other newsworthy items, the Turner decision? Okay, I, I'm going to yeah, because and I'm so glad we had this in-depth discussion on tax pol- policy. I want to emphasize. So if we drop some of our proposed topics this week, I don't care because I think this was really good. <laughs> This was excellent. This and it was, was important. Excellent. This is important yeah. substantive topics. It's not seersucker land, although that's <laughs> also very – Although I have uh, a seersucker jacket on. You do. Oh, my. There's solidarity in this room. Thank you I very much. I wore this intentionally. <laughs> if it was Wednesday, I would have worn it. <laughs> it's, it's Thursday. Okay. Yes, so, that's right. Yeah, at least as we're recording this. Well, the, uh, the Turner decision came out from the Supreme Court um, earlier. Uh, Senator, do you want to talk a little bit about that decision? A little bit on what you think it means? Well, there's a there's a uh, there's a statute um, that was enacted, I believe, in the early 1990s that said basically if there if you're a student in a failing school district, um, somebody a, a district that loses its accreditation, you have the ability uh, to go to a district an adjoining school district 
And what this meant a couple of years ago when this first came up uh, in 2011, I believe, um, St. Louis uh, Public was um, unaccredited. And that had obviously an impact on all of the surrounding school districts, and the, particularly in the inner ring suburbs, but all of St. Louis County, um, because it's any county that touches um, uh, – you know, St. Louis City. Um, St. Louis City, St. Louis Public now is provisionally accredited. So it has a, it's a little bit of a different implication, but you still have Normandy and Riverview Gardens that are unaccredited. So theoretically, a student in one of those two districts that's unaccredited can attend um, any school um, in that county, in St. Louis County, or in an adjoining county, presumably St. Charles County. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what the, the state, and I haven't read the opinion yet. It came out uh, yesterday, but if, if we're at where we're at um, in 2011, that's the basic kind of framework of the argument. And so then the question becomes, and look, here's where I'm at. I represent a lot of those districts, Kirkwood, um, Parkway, you know, those districts. And um, I think at the end of the day, I believe that, that those kids deserve an opportunity in, in St. Louis Public um, or in those other districts to get the best education they can. Um, and they deserve that. I think if you look at um, how uh, and, and one of the issues that, that that the city has, and the mayor readily admits this, is you got to have quality schools to keep those middle class families in St. Louis City. And so we've got to be serious about um, maybe a different level of reform and being more serious. Uh, and even if it's just in the St. Louis region, I'm okay with that. But sometimes in our state, uh, we have a we have a large rural delegation too, and they view yes. that as well, this is, we don't have a problem here, and, and why are you bringing your issues to us? And so we've got to work through all that. But one of the other things that I do think is important to point out, though, is for taxpayers in those um, receiving school districts, you know, if they, the discussion a couple years ago is if they have room, um, we, w- we wanted to make sure that, they're, that those slots were made available for people to transfer. But the bigger question then becomes, what is the obligation then? Do the, to the extent of the law, does it require those receiving districts to then hire new teachers and pay for them to build new right. buildings? And right. so those are some of the questions, you know, that we're going to have to work through. Um, and it overlays this other issue, Joe, that, um, that is much more complicated that I believe and been talking about for a couple of years. We've got to take a look at our foundation formula again. We have a situation where in probably in the listening audience, in the city and, and in the county in particular, over 90 percent of a kid's education uh, in those districts like Kirkwood comes from local taxpayers. Correct. J- just so the listeners know, the foundation formula is, bas- is the state's basic funding uh, program that sends money back to the individual uh, right. school districts. Right. And so we, for that's the single largest appropriation in our budget. $3 billion a year go to the over 520 some odd but, school yeah, districts. Yeah, but very, very small percentage goes to the suburban Right. Schools. Kirkwood, for example, very, gets very a, couple, a couple hundred bucks a kid. So every, the, the rest of the $12,000 comes from local taxpayers. And then those tax dollars go to Jefferson City and then are distributed among the other school districts in the state, some of which may be only funded at a local level, say 40%. Right. So you've got a real – I think it's time for us to really take a look at this. The other thing in that formula is we pay – there's $20 million a year we pay to school districts that have declining enrollment on their smaller school districts. We pay for kids they had in 2005 that they don't have anymore. We're paying for phantom kids in those districts because it was part of the deal in 2000. And so I think this is an opportunity for a, a very substantive discussion, um, which is what we're supposed to be doing up there, um, about how we fund K-12 through education with the single largest appropriation. We're spending – now, it doesn't hit those ambitious targets of the foundation formula, but we're still – we put $66 million more into that formula this year. It's at historic highs. But – the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, because it's short of where that funding formula is supposed to be, is arbitrarily shifting around $130 million to school districts. It's costing special school district $3 million a year, St. Louis Public $11.5 million a year because Desi's violating the law. Mm. And until someone sues and challenges Desi on that, we kind of have what we have. Think about what you could do in St. Louis Public with $11 million. You could have a heck of a pilot project to try and provide a better educational opportunity for those kids. And in special school district, I think personally, this is something that really bothers me. The fact that Desi is doing that to special school district, which is primarily a local, uh, it's countywide, um, and to, to, to take $3 million a year that they're not entitled to under the law and distribute it somewhere else is a politically pragmatic decision for them to make because they were trying to avoid the ire of other districts, but it's illegal. And so you've got the Turner decision, you've got the foundation formula, and hopefully that's, those are two issues that we can deal with next year.
So just, I guess we're hitting the 30 minute mark. So I guess I'll just briefly summate the last news item is that yeah. the attorney general of Missouri, Chris Coster, a Democrat, Democrat, used to be a Republican, <laughs> as we all know, yep. and probably running for governor in 2016. Definitely made, running for de- governor yeah. in 2016. Made an announcement at, at Jefferson Jackson Days that he's going to put in $400,000 over the next four years to help uh, Democratic legislative candidates. Now, I think this year the Democrats are actually playing defense in two seats. They've only targeted one seat so far in the 24th. They're going to need to expand well, to do the, that in the Senate. Yeah, and for our listeners, the Democrats are heavily outnumbered yes. in, in the House and the Senate. The, as uh, the senator already alluded to, the, the Republicans right now have veto-proof majorities if they stick so together. So my question yeah. to you is, you know— are Republicans shaking in their boots by that? Or do you think that, you know, you'll be able to withstand the attorney general's flurry of money, per se? Well, I think he uh, he probably got some goodwill out of that with the uh, with the Democrats that were in the room. That I was not invited to that event, so I didn't hear the <laughs> speech first. I wasn't invited. But, uh, but he probably established some goodwill. Look, I think in a lot of these races, it just it comes down to the candidates and how hard they're going to work and their ability to, um, you know, you can, uh, my example and other examples, Democrats and Republicans, you can outperform in those Senate districts because they're, they're, I mean, it's, there's only 34 of them. There's 170,000 people. But you can get, if you really work, you can get out there and meet people and get your message across. Um, but I think one of the things that's probably true, though, is, and I don't necessarily think this is a good thing, most of the districts um, across our state, and I can only speak for the Senate districts because I, I haven't drilled down on the numbers as much in the House, they're not that competitive. No, they're not. They're not that competitive. And I, and I, wish, and I wish we had more competitive districts. I really do. I think it would um, – um, uh, it'd be a good thing, and but we don't have that many of them. So if you look to twenty um, fourteen, there's three. There's three. You know, in every cycle, there's maybe another three. Um, and what? And I tell you, the map is fascinating for all the political junkies. Yes. I know you guys are too. <laughs> yeah. You know, the only real difference between the map now, if you look at a map of the state of Missouri, in in now, say thirty years ago, is rural Missouri. Rural Missouri was all blue. Now it's right. all red. You had exactly. urban Democrats, you had suburban Republicans, you have fewer suburban Republicans now. But you had blue and then red and then you had it was all blue in in rural Missouri. Now it's all red. I mean there's not a single Democrat that represents rural Missouri. I mean Ryan McKenna, Senator Ryan McKenna he, is a friend of mine. He, he would dispute that he's even rural. Yeah he uh he's on the ag committee and something I think he wonders why. But uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh but he's a good guy. But um, no, it's just you just don't have that many competitive districts. And so there will be a few. There's a few every cycle. But uh, I, I think it would be a good thing if we had more of those. Now, one last question before mm-hmm. we go off the air. I mean, you had been talked about running statewide in 2012. You didn't do it. You were looked at as a potential lieutenant governor candidate. You opted not to. 2016, term limits kick in. You won't be running for reelection. Uh, I mean, is there any news that we should <laughs> uh, close out with? I th- I think there may there may be opportunities, but but not to sound like a total meet the press answer. I am <laughs> I am focused on on. I think there's a lot of important work to do uh, in in the Senate right now, and that's what I'm focused on. And, and chairing that important committee on economic development, being leadership, to try to move an agenda forward is what I'm focused on right now. Uh, but we'll see. Okay. There is always a Kirkwood school board or something that's right. like that. Yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, well, we'll have him back on in, in 2015 to see if we can get a, a, a better answer out of that one. A better answer might be the better way, but yeah. Uh, you can read all of my stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can read all of Joe and Jason's stories at stlbeacon.org. You can follow me on Twitter at, at @csmcdaniel. You can follow Jason on Twitter at... Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Joe on Twitter at... At Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And you can follow the senator on yeah. Twitter. Eric at. with a C underscore Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T-T. Y- yours is a little more complicated. Than ours. <laughs> and, and I know the underscore. No I wish the S-C-H, the Eric Schmidt was taken, so there's an underscore in between. <laughs> Probably by the Google person. So. That's right. <laughs> well, yes. Senator, thank you very much for joining us. Thank we'll you be for back. having me. We'll be back next week. It's worth pointing out that uh, we had a Republican senator on this week, and next week we're planning on having a Democratic senator on. Yes. We're planning on uh, rotating that every week. We'll be back next week. Until then, so long. So long. Thanks. So long. (laughs) The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer. St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on the Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.